Suppose that we are going to try to go to a far planet. There would be three phases to the trip, out through the Earth's atmosphere, through space, and the re-entry into the atmosphere of the planet we're planning to land on. The first two phases would admittedly present formidable problems, but the last phase, the re-entry phase, would be the most critical. Coming in from outer space, the craft would, for all practical purposes, be similar to a meteorite, except that it would be powered and not free-falling. You would have myriad problems associated with aerodynamic heating, high aerodynamic loadings, and very probably a host of other problems that no one can now conceive of. Certain of these problems could be partially solved by laboratory experimentation, but nothing can replace flight testing, and the results obtained by flight tests in our atmosphere would not be valid in another type of atmosphere. The most logical way to overcome this difficulty would be to build our interplanetary vehicle, go to the planet that we were interested in landing on, and hover several hundred miles up. From this altitude, we could send instrumented test vehicles down to the planet. If we didn't want the inhabitants of the planet, if it were inhabited, to know what we were doing, we could put destruction devices in the test vehicle, or arrange the test so that the test vehicles would just plain burn up at a certain point due to aerodynamic heating. They continued, each man injecting his ideas. Maybe the green fireballs are test vehicles, somebody else's. The regular UFO reports might be explained by the fact that the manned vehicles were venturing down to within 100,000 or 200,000 feet of the Earth, or to the altitude at which atmosphere re-entry begins to get critical. I had to go down to the airstrip to get a Carco Airlines plane back to Albuquerque, so I didn't have time to ask a lot of questions that came into my mind. I did get to make one comment. From the people didn't think the green fireballs were any kind of natural phenomenon. Not exactly, they said, but so far the evidence that said they were a natural phenomenon was vastly outweighed by the evidence that said they weren't. During the kidney-jolting trip down the valley from Los Alamos to Albuquerque in one of the Carco Airlines' bonanzas, I decided that I'd stay over an extra day and talk to Dr. La Paz. He knew every detail there was to know about the green fireballs. He confirmed my findings, that the genuine green fireballs were no longer being seen. He said that he'd received hundreds of reports especially after he had written several articles about the mysterious fireballs, but that all of the reported objects were just greenish-colored, common, everyday meteors. Dr. La Paz said that some people, including Dr. Joseph Kaplan and Dr. Edward Teller, thought that the green fireballs were natural meteors. He didn't think so, however, for several reasons. First, the color was so much different. To illustrate his point, Dr. La Paz opened his desk drawer and took out a well-worn chart of the color spectrum. He checked off two shades of green, one a pale, almost yellowish green, and the other a much more distinct, vivid green. He pointed to the bright green and told me that this was the color of the green fireballs. He'd taken this chart with him when he went out to talk to people who had seen the green fireballs, and everyone had picked this one color. The pale green, he explained, was the color reported in the cases of documented green meteors. Then there were other points of dissimilarity between a meteor and the green fireballs. The trajectory of the fireballs was too flat. Dr. La Paz explained that a meteor doesn't necessarily have to arch down across the sky. Its trajectory can appear to be flat, but not as flat as that of the green fireballs. Then there was the size. Almost always such descriptive words as terrifying, as big as the moon, and blinding had been used to describe the fireballs. Meteors just aren't this big and bright. No, 
Dr. La Paz didn't think that they were meteors. Dr. La Paz didn't believe that they were meteorites either. A meteorite is accompanied by sound and shock waves that break windows and stampede cattle. Yet in every case of a green fireball sighting, the observers reported that they did not hear any sound. But the biggest mystery of all was the fact that no particles of a green fireball had ever been found. If they were meteorites, Dr. La Paz was positive that he would have found one. He'd missed very few times in the cases of known meteorites. He pulled a map out of his file to show me what he meant. It was a map that he had used to plot the spot where a meteorite had hit the earth. I believe it was in Kansas. The map had been prepared from information he had obtained from dozens of people who had seen the meteorite come flaming toward the earth. At each spot where an observer was standing, he'd drawn in the observer's line of sight to the meteorite. From the dozens of observers he had obtained dozens of lines of sight. The lines all converged to give Dr. La Paz a plot of the meteorite's downward trajectory. Then he had been able to plot the spot where it had struck the earth. He and his crew went to the marked area, probed the ground with long steel poles, and found the meteorite. This was just one case that he showed me. He had records of many more similar successful expeditions in his file. Then he showed me some other maps. The plotted lines looked identical to the ones on the map I'd just seen. Dr. La Paz had used the same techniques on these plots and had marked an area where he wanted to search. He had searched the area many times, but he had never found anything. These were plots of the path of a green fireball. When Dr. La Paz had finished, I had one last question. What do you think they are? He weighed the question for a few seconds then he said that all he cared to say was that he didn't think they were a natural phenomenon. He thought that maybe someday one would hit the earth and the mystery would be solved. He hoped that they were a natural phenomenon. After my talk with Dr. La Paz, I can well understand his apparent calmness on the night of September 18, 1954, when the newspaper reporter called him to find out if he planned to investigate this latest green fireball report. He was speaking from experience, not indifference, when he said, But I don't expect to find anything. If the green fireballs are back, I hope that Dr. La Paz gets an answer this time. The story of the UFO now goes back to late January 1949 the time when the Air Force was in the midst of the Green Fireball mystery. In another part of the country, another odd series of events was taking place. The center of activity was a highly secret area that can't be named, and the recipient of the UFOs, which were formations of little lights, was the U.S. Army. The series of incidents started when military patrols who were protecting the area began to report seeing formations of lights flying through the night sky. At first, the lights were reported every three or four nights, but inside of two weeks, the frequency had stepped up. Before long, they were a nightly occurrence. Some patrols reported that they had seen three or four formations in one night. The sightings weren't restricted to the men on patrol. One night, just at dusk, during retreat, the entire garrison watched a formation pass directly over the post-parade ground. The description of the lights varied, but the majority of the observers reported a V formation of three lights. As the formation moved through the sky, the lights changed in color from a bluish-white to orange and back to bluish-white. This color cycle took about two seconds. The lights usually traveled from west to east and made no sound. They didn't streak across the sky like a meteor, but they were going faster than a jet. The lights were a little bigger than the biggest star. Once in a while the G.I.s would get binoculars on them, 
but they couldn't see any more details. The lights just looked bigger. From the time of the first sighting, reports of the little lights were being sent to the Air Force through Army intelligence channels. The reports were getting to ATIC, but the green fireball activity was taking top billing and no comments went back to the Army about their little lights. According to an Army G-2 major to whom I talked in the Pentagon, this silence was taken to mean that no action, other than sending in reports, was necessary on the part of the Army. But after about two weeks of nightly sightings and no apparent action by the Air Force, the commander of the installation decided to take the initiative and set a trap. His staff worked out a plan in record time. Special UFO patrols would be sent out into the security area and they would be furnished with sighting equipment. This could be the equipment that they normally used for fire control. Each patrol would be sent to a specific location and would set up a command post. Operating out of the command post at points where the sky could be observed would be sighting teams. Each team had sighting equipment to measure the elevation and azimuth angle of the UFO. Four men were to be on each team, an instrument man, a timer, a recorder, and a radio operator. All the UFO patrols would be assigned special radio frequencies. The operating procedure would be that when one sighting team spotted a UFO, the radio operator would call out his team's location, the location of the UFO in the sky, and the direction it was going. All of the other teams from his patrol would thus know when to look for the UFO and begin to sight on it. While the radio man was reporting, the instrument man on the team would line up the UFO and begin to call out the angles of elevation and azimuth. The timer would call out the time. The recorder would write all of this down. The command post, upon hearing the report of the UFO, would call the next patrol and tell them. They too would try to pick it up. Here was an excellent opportunity to get some concrete data on at least one type of UFO. It was something that should have been done from the start. Speeds, altitudes, and sizes that are estimated just by looking at a UFO are miserably inaccurate. But if you could accurately establish that some type of object was traveling 30,000 miles an hour, or even 3,000 miles an hour, through our atmosphere, the UFO story would be the biggest story since the creation. The plan seemed foolproof and had the full support of every man who was to participate. For the first time in history, every GI wanted to get on the patrols. The plan was quickly written up as a field order, approved, and mimeographed. Since the Air Force had the prime responsibility for the UFO investigation, it was decided that the plan should be quickly coordinated with the Air Force, so a copy was rushed to them. Time was critical because every group of nightly reports might be the last. Everything was ready to roll the minute the Air Force said, go. The Air Force didn't okay the plan. I don't know where the plan was killed or who killed it, but it was killed. Its death caused two reactions. Many people thought that the plan was killed so 